Um, I don't think I actually need these headphones. They just like feel like a protective shield um, against anxiety. Um, you know, it's like wearing sunglasses. It feels good. Um, so thank you so much for coming to the virtual launch of Milkfed. Um, and um, I'm gonna start off, I'm gonna read from the book and then um, talk a little about the book. And then we're gonna do some questions and answers about the book and about like whatever. You can like ask stuff, whatever you want um, in the Q and A. So, um, and um, it's interesting because I feel like I'm sort of speaking into the void right now. Um, but um, yeah, thank you for coming and thank you for being on the other end. Um, and um, so, uh, the scenes I'm going to read, I'm going to read two sex scenes because my other events, um, I've got an event at the Philly Free Library next week and I think online and I think my um, mom's friends are going to be there. So I like can't, I don't know exactly who is like at this event. Like if my aunt Etta is here, I'm sorry in advance. Um, however, I'm just going to go for it with two of my sexier scenes in the book. Although there is... Um, the book is really a cornucopia of sex, so, um, you know. But this is, so this is, um, this scene is um, a scene in which Rachel, um, who's the protagonist of the book, and she's sort of, like, I'll call her, like, she's sort of like our lady of disordered eating, our lady of mommy issues, um, our lady of, like, inability to feel worthy of pleasure. Um, so she has just started a 90 day communication detox with her mother who lives across the country. Rachel lives in LA and Rachel is now grappling with the lust that she feels for a MILF uh, named Anna who works in her office. Um, well, Anna's more of like a G MILF, but I'm like getting up there in years. So to me, she's like MILF, you know, cause she's, but for some of you, she might be like a, a grand MILF. So anyway, okay, so this is Rachel. Anna was the only maternal figure I had left. I wanted to please her more than ever. I wanted her to soak me in praise. I also recognized that I was physically attracted to her. This was something I'd tried to conceal, especially from myself, but it was bursting out of me. Every time I masturbated, Anna popped into my head, and when she surfaced, her giant breasts and slender waist, the little bulge just above her pussy, her heady white floral perfume, I always blocked her image out. I felt ashamed as though it were my own mother I was fantasizing about. But on night four of the detox, as I masturbated drowsily in bed, I allowed myself to imagine being with Anna fully for the first time. I was her daughter and had menstrual cramps. Mommy Anna had cajoled me into bed with a cup of Harney and Sons tea. Anna's like really into Harney and Sons tea at the office. I lay still under the cool sheets as she spoke to me in a hushed voice, almost a whisper. Can I rub your belly, she asked. She was wearing a pink bathrobe, which was slightly open, and I could see the length of her abundant breasts in the dim light. Yes, I said, that would be nice. She really wanted to comfort me. She was just aching to soothe me. She was dying for it. I felt beautiful and treasured as she cooed and rubbed my lower abdomen over my cotton pajamas. I was wearing cotton pajamas as I touched myself in reverie. I'm gonna take this off, she said of her robe, so I can be more comfortable in rubbing you. Okay, I said. When she opened her robe, a waft of her white floral perfume came toward me like a sweet and filthy wind. There were also the smell of her pussy in the air, salty and there, sorry, there was also the smell of her pussy in the air, salty and a little fishy. Her breasts were gorgeous pendulums with big nipples, the color of dusky valentines, ample and perfect. But that bump below her waist, just above her pussy, where the flesh had gathered in her aging drove me the craziest. I wanted to rub against it, then work my way down to her pubic hair, unshaved and unwaxed, a thick mound of dark and coarse femininity. I could hear her breathing as she rubbed my abdomen softly. How does that feel, she asked. Good, I whispered. Good, she said. I was beginning to get the feeling she liked me as more than a daughter. 
I mean, she was naked, but she hadn't touched any parts of me yet that a mother wouldn't touch. I want you to feel good, she said, as she continued to tenderly stroke my tummy. She moved her body over me so that her face was by my face, her hair brushing against my cheek. She nuzzled my forehead, the tip of my nose, my neck. Then she kissed me very lightly on the lips. There was a pause. Then she kissed me again, this time with her mouth open. Her tongue was in my mouth, tasting for mine like a ripe strawberry. So it was confirmed. Mommy wanted me. She was seducing me and she didn't even seem the least bit ashamed. If she wasn't ashamed, then I wouldn't be ashamed. I was merely the seducee. I was the innocent one here. You are the innocent one here, she said. I loved being the innocent one. I heard a soft moan come out of my mouth, filling hers. Gently, she lifted up my shirt and moved her lips to my nipples. I felt like I was made of liquid, viscous, throbbing with ache. I continued to rub myself frantically, imagining what would come next. I replayed that first tongue kiss again and again. Then she let her tits dangle over my face. I suckled on each one, thinking, feed me, mommy, so that I may live. My real mother had not breastfed me. She said I hurt her nipples too much. I knew that if Anna were my mother, she would have breastfed me as a little baby. Now she was doing it again. I sucked as much as I could of her nipple in my mouth. I wanted to choke on her, to gag on her, to be filled up entirely with her breast, all the way down my throat. I made little squelching noises as I sucked. Her legs straddled my thigh. Then she began to ride me. Her thigh moved on my pussy in a circular motion. Her pubic hair was thick and wiry. I could feel her wetness, how much she wanted me. I could smell her fish and flowers. She was doing everything. I only had to lie there and be myself. Every time I got close to coming, I would stop masturbating and let the wave of my pleasure simmer back down. I want you to eat me, I thought, as I edged closer. The consuming mother, I thought, as I pulled away. I want you to eat me, closer, closer. The consuming mother, further, further. Then I got so close that I could not pull myself back from the edge. I spilled over, dissolving into pure light. When the wave of pleasure receded, Mommy Anna had disappeared. In her place was office man manager Anna. She was, she was seated in a Staples ergonomic chair Head set on, eating a shrimp Caesar from Simply Salad, answering the phone. The crew, she said, please hold. The crew is the name of like the horrific talent management company where they work. Okay. Um, so as the book progresses, Rachel um, is confronted by a mystic mensch, a Zoftig kosher coquette named Miriam, um, who opens up her appetites um, for real sex, not just uh, fantasy, and um, food, um, and sort of starts to bend um, the limits of her food restriction. Um, so this next scene is another fantasy that Rachel has about her office worker, Anna, but it happens um, after um, she has sort of been, Rachel has been sort of possessed by this woman, Miriam, and her appetites have been opened. Um, and at this scene, she is at the gym trying to take her body back. So, um, okay. After work, I had no energy for the gym. I chewed two pieces of nicotine gum at once and went anyway. When I changed into my workout clothes, I discovered that my spandex shorts were now so tight they gave me camel toe, chronic camel toe. Every time I fixed the toe, it emerged again, somehow deeper. On the elliptical machine, I let the shorts rub against me, feeling horny. It was some new kind of horniness or maybe a very old kind, raw lust, like when I first discovered masturbation and indulged in it daily. The horniness felt like hunger itself. I was fully famished and I didn't know whether it was food or sex I wanted. Maybe I wanted both. All of this eating seemed to have made me sex more sexually charged, awake. But what was waking up exactly, my pussy or my soul? 
I was scared of my soul. What if my soul was monstrous? If a person had a monstrous soul, should she still follow it? I switched to the stationary bike. As I pedaled, my pussy rubbed against the black leather seat and I felt a delicious warmth spread throughout my pelvis. The front of the bike seat was horn shaped. It poked out in front of me like a cock. I took to this right away, having my own thick cock. I wanted to make the cock come alive, to say a blessing over it. Frankencock, a bike seat dick. I began reciting quietly any Hebrew I could remember. Nun gimel hay shin, nun gimel hay shin. I said, intoning the letters on the dreidel to the rhythm of my pedaling. O se shalom bim romav, huya se shalom alenu, I sang to myself, using the old tune I knew. But I felt guilty using my grandmother's favorite song to animate a penis. Eitz chaim chai lemachazim ba vetomecha meushar, I crooned internally, delivering a captivating performance of the Tree of Life song. Suddenly, I felt incredibly powerful, as though my cock were really coming alive. I imagined as I pedaled that Anna was sucking me. For the first time, I felt no hesitance in fantasizing about her sexually. It was as though the cock protected me from judgment. I had total power over Anna. She looked up at me as I teased her face. She begged me to let her lick it. When I finally let her have it, grunting, all right, suck, I acted like I was doing her a favor. She licked and sucked me and I felt stimulated by two things, her mouth and my newfound dominance. I felt like another kind of creature altogether, some new being I had invoked. If I was a woman, I was not me as I'd known myself, but a woman with more courage than I thought I'd had. I was a woman of impulse, a woman of instinct. I was a woman of pleasure and a woman of confidence. I was a woman of appetites, a growling beast. I was a person. I continued to pedal, closing my eyes, rubbing against the seat. I imagined Anna sliding my cock between her tits, rubbing me on her nipples, gasping as though she could come from that contact alone. It was like her nipples were two clits. I whipped her nipples with my dick, then whipped her face with it. Her expression grew ar serious, ardent. She begged me to put it inside her. At this point in the fantasy, I hit something of a choose your own adventure. One choice was to lick her pussy. I wanted to taste her badly. Another was to deprive her. I didn't want to give her any help in getting wet. I wanted to know that her wetness was effortless, spontaneous, a reaction to the sight and feel of me. I wanted her to be so intoxicated by my presence that she became a river. In the end, I went with option A, lick it. Why should I rob myself the taste of her elixir? I ate her dripping wet pussy, ate it good, but I kept my reaction very self-contained. No reason for her to know how much pleasure it gave me. On the outside, I was a haughty daughter, then an impenetrable, impenetrable soldier, just doing her job gruffly. But on the inside, I, revel, I reveled in honest taste, coppery, like a shipwrecked chalice at the bottom of the ocean. Now she was crying for my cock. I decided that I would fuck her from behind. I turned around and bit her gently on the ass, which was ample, but saggy with age. The sagginess turned me on even more. I massaged her ass cheeks, opened them like a book and aimed straight for her pussy hole, a lovely shade of purple, seedless grape. I parked my cock right there at the entrance. She moaned, but not out of pain. Please, she said, please. When I felt she had begged long enough, I activated Frankencock. She groaned with delight and began moving back and forth on the length of me so that I barely had to thrust, but I wanted to thrust. I grabbed her hips and steadied her. Stop fucking moving, I said. Then I used the power of my own hips to thrust deeper into her. I could go as long as I wanted, but while my phantom cock was made out of a seat, I could still feel all the pleasure in my organ. I felt a surge of tenderness for her as I came. Do not go there, I said to myself, no heart. I wrote out the orgasm with the pleasure between my legs alone. It felt so good that I gave a little yelp out loud. I looked over at the man on the bike to my right. He was an older man, maybe 70, with white hair. He had headphones on and seemed totally absorbed in what he was listening to. I got the feeling it was an audiobook, maybe David Baldacci or Clive Cussler. I laughed and closed my eyes again. Then I pedaled out the last waves of my orgasm. Okay, so um, I'm just going to talk for a couple minutes. Um, so like a lot of times as a writer, 
um, in interviews and stuff, people are like, so tell me about your process or like, they're like, tell me about the, the inspiration behind the book. And um, so I was thinking about it and I made like a little glossary of inspiration for behind this book that I just thought I would like maybe like read um, or like talk about. Um, but I'm not gonna talk about my process unless someone asks my process. Okay, my process is like being alive and like being uncomfortable with being alive and then like needing a way to deal with it and like writing. Okay, so, um, okay, so here's like a glossary of inspiration for, for Milk Fed. So first thing is body, body. See also dysmorphia. See also living in one. See also spiritual being having human experience I didn't ask for. See also, I used to think that spirituality was like, I'm over here on a lotus and I'm on some really good like heroin -y ecstasy and like humanity is over here and like no one can touch me. But over time, I've kind of come to see spirituality as like more of a process with like kind of learning to be sort of okay maybe like with being human um, and also like a human among humans. Um, and then, um, yeah, and then also, I don't know why, but I, I was thinking a lot about like, have you ever like gone to like an exercise class and the teacher is like, give yourself a big pat on the back for being here. Like, remember why you came here today. And like, I always feel like I'm just like, uh, like, because like, I hate myself and can't let myself live in peace, you know? So like, that's what I was thinking about with the body. So this is very much, um, Body book, living in a body book, challenges of living in a body book, self-deception, deception of others regarding the body. Okay. The next is certitude. So um, I don't like certitude. Um, I feel like, I kind of feel like, well, I feel like truth is one and paths are many. Like I don't have like one religion. Like I was raised Jewish, but like I kind of have like different religious paths. Swami Satchidananda said, truth is one, paths are many. And I, and I believe that. Um, but certitude, I don't know, I kind of feel like there's more truth in the questions. And um, I feel like, like right now, culturally, there's just like an obsession with certitude. Like we like have these like personal brands and we like memoji ourselves and we proclaim these like political and tribal allegiances. Um, and there's like a moral certitude about everything. And I feel like milk fed, I wanted to like challenge my own like false certitudes, you know, first of all, it's like, look within, I'm not like really, like, I'd rather like challenge my own bullshit than like other people's because I feel like there's like, I will never like run out of bullshit within here to like challenge. So, but, but yeah, to challenge like my own, the things that I like thought I was certain of and kind of like the, the questions of like, how do we know what we know to be true? And like, also can belief of like an intellectual or emotional variety, like make something true? So if we believe, you know, right? Um, and also can conflicting beliefs, which are held deeply by like two individuals or two groups, both be true just by the nature of them both being believed. Um, and also like, how do we live when there's, when there's a conflict of beliefs that like exists within us. So these were all questions that really informed the writing of Milk Fed for me. Okay, so the next item in the glossary is Roth comma Philip. So um, I definitely think like some North stars of this book, like Poor Noise Complaint, Sabbath Theater um, and Goodbye Columbus. Um, I remember reading my dad's copy of Goodbye Columbus for the first time when I was in, when I was like, I think I was like 11. Um, and Neil Klugman, the protagonist, describes like his family's type of Judaism, which is a very like tuna salad-y, like Newark Judaism versus his love interest, Brenda Potemkin's family's Judaism, which is like sort of like a nose job, like very fresh fruit nouveau riche Judaism. And like the dichotomy between like the tuna salad and like Judaism and like the like nouveau riche, like bah, like nose job, fresh fruit Judaism. Like it was something that I just understood on like a bones level. I was like, I don't know that I've ever understood something so deeply. Um, so shout out to Philip and shout out to my dad, who's um, 
been in the ICU for the past seven weeks um, after an accident. Um, okay, tuna salad is the next item on the list. So to me, food and Judaism are inextricable. Um, Judaism is a very tuna salad -y religion. Um, and like the protagonist, Rachel, I was raised more like in a community of sort of like um, Chanel bag type Jew than like Talmud Jew. Like it, I didn't find much like spiritual substance, su sustenance, except in the choir. I was in this Jewish choir at the, at the synagogue, Junior Jammers, and I was like really into that. It was really, I really liked the music. I still love the music. Um, but so, but Judaism and food have always been like inextricably linked for me. Like, um, like one of my earliest memories is like making like dioramas of a sukkah. Um, a sukkah is like this Jewish harvest hut that you like sit under every year in the fall. We would make these like dioramas, like a mini one out of like graham crackers and icing and like, like binge eating the like sukkah, like stealing the ingredients and binge eating it. Or like my mom giving me money to give to sadaka, which like a dollar, which is like charity and like going to the little like gift shop and spending the dollar on like like as many bags of Hanukkah gelt and like binge eating the chocolate this is my confession so um so and a few years ago I started feeling like this longing for the cultural Judaism of my childhood and I couldn't figure out why because I was like I live in LA like there's no shortage of Jews here like it's literally fiddler on the roof basically at all times and like, I realized that um, what I was missing was like um, this feeling of innocence that I used to feel um, when I would go with my grandparents to Second Avenue Deli or Ratner's or um, which doesn't exist anymore or Gus's Pickles or um, Carnegie. Um, and at the time that felt like unconditional love. Um, but as I grew up and, and now looking back, like I kind of question some of the beliefs, um, some of their beliefs that I was being fed then, um, like along with the food. So it's sort of like, I don't know, Milk Fed's definitely an exploration of like, what is unconditional love, right? Like, um, I mean, and, and also I think like a questioning of like self-love, like I feel like now there's this, there's sort of a self-love industrial complex now, you know, and it makes it, it, to me, it seems like it's like, oh, there's like something we're supposed to arrive at. Like I'm supposed to like arrive at a sense of wholeness or like I'm supposed to, um, and it's like um, actually like maybe there's no arrival. Maybe there's no like enlightenment or like end to the spiritual journey. Like it's just, um, you know, like the brokenness, like is it, you know, and so, those are all sort of things that I thought about when writing Milk Fed. Um, okay, and I'll just go through like one more and then we'll do questions. Um, so let's see. Okay, so the last thing is, um, or one thing is perfection, the idea of perfection. So my ideas of perfection um, have always been really fucked up and warped, right? Like they're based on these sort of things that I was fed, ideas that I was fed that I believe to be true of the world. Um, particularly in regards to like um, what I'm supposed to look like um, and what beauty is. Um, and so they're very much ideas based on lack and on striving. And a few years ago, I ended up looking, I looked up the definition of perfection um, in the dictionary and I didn't like a lot of the definitions that I found, but there was one that I found that said perfection, lacking nothing essential to the whole. And it sort of, it made me think about um, like, yeah, I do lack, right? Like I am like, I'm not like this sort of goop version of like a whole person, but I actually am not lacking anything essential to the whole, right? Like even in like, in my sort of like imperfection, I'm not lacking anything essential to the whole. So it's like in a way, like, you know, I'm already perfect, like by that definition. And it's like the more I strive for some weird ass definition of perfection that like I've invented, like kind of the further from that um, I, definition of perfection I stray. So um, 
that was something that I was grappling with in writing. Milk fed. Okay. So it's 420 or 728 your time, 428 my time. I'm going to answer some questions. Okay. How do you, okay. How do you keep pickle occupied while you're trying to write? Pickle has been here this whole time. He's complete picks. Pickle, say hi. He's very unimpressed. Um, if Pickle has a lap, he's chill. But if he doesn't have a lap, um, there's problems. But yeah, Pickle doesn't give a shit like what lists I'm on, like what book coverage I get, like who reviews the book, what they say, how many copies are sold. Although it's in his best interest for me to make a living because um, he's not cheap. I mean, he was, he was free. He was a rescue, but he lives the life of Riley here. Okay. Um, uh, let's see. How do you decide how much of yourself you want to show in your work? It's very personal. How do you decide on your limits? Um, it's a good question. I think I tend to go like, I like to just with my first drafts, I just totally go, I go for it. You know what I'm saying? Like, I don't think about, in my first drafts, I often dictate when it's prose. Um, I use Siri, um, I dictate and I use a notes app and um, like a free simple note app. It's called Simple Note. Shout out Simple Note. I love Simple Note. It's like this app. It's like, I like it better than the notes app on the phone because the notes app on the phone has those yellow lines and Simple Note's like very, it's just like blank. So um, yeah, so I dictate and I think I do that so that I can not self-censor so that I cannot self-censor because I'm definitely a perfectionist. So for my first drafts, I have to like trick myself into generating um, like enough bulk. Also coming from a poetry background, it's always like, well, why would you say in like 200 or 300 pages what you would say in like two or three pages? So I dictate and, and um, I let myself be messy. And so I really don't censor and I don't think about audience or, or my mother or um, I mean, unless she's in the text or which often she is um, or, um, you know, like it's just kind of like, it's like the flow. It's all about the flow. And then in my edits, that's when I begin to think about the audience, you know, and um, that's when I begin to think about, um, is this true? And I don't mean true in a, like a fiction or reality, a fiction, a fiction versus like um, accuracy sense. I mean, true more in like a bones truth. Like, is, is this supposed to be here? You know, like, is this supposed to be here? And I think it was Nabokov who was like, um, torture, your, I think he said something like torture your sentences or torture your reader. And, um, you know, I've never worked so hard on a book as I worked on Milk Fed. Like I thought I was, was done. And then like the, like, I mean, it was just this never ending process of like being like, okay, I'm just gonna go in and like noodle. And then it was like being back in the weeds. Like, and I actually like being in the weeds. I like love the weeds. Like the weeds is like, like I love just like being in pajamas and like living in the fucking weeds, but I always forget that I like the weeds. And so like when I'm not in the weeds and I get like an editorial letter back from my editor or like notes from my agent or I reread it and I'm like, ah, this needs to be pulled apart. Like there's always the moment of like, and this is true too, I think of like starting any writing process, not just the editorial process of like, I stand on the precipice of the weeds and I'm like, I got to get back in there. And like, I don't want to go. And like, I have a moment where I'm just like, why am I doing this? And like, you know, zero, like all self-doubt, just like all self-doubt. But then like, once you're in the weeds, it's like awesome. You know, like, I'm like, oh, like, this is why I'm alive is to be in the weeds. Like, this is like the only time I'm like fulfilled, but I like forget that I like the weeds. Um, so yeah, so it's the edit editing process is when I decide my limits. Um, okay. I feel like having read your previous work, I feel like I see some of the themes from So Sad Today in Rachel. Anxiety, disordered eating, how much if any of Rachel's crafted in your image or based on your own experiences? Well, you know, I mean, I guess like I'm in a way I'm Rachel's mom, right? Like, cause I birthed her cause she's a character. That's like the most weird writer thing to say. Like I birthed this character, but like, you know, I mean, I kind of did. 
And so, you know, I think the way to answer that question is that when I wrote the Pisces, um, I remember a lot of people were asking me like, what was it like writing a fictional dep depressed character as opposed to like writing memoir about your experience with depression and I was like Lucy the main character I was like Lucy's not depressed and then I like went back and I was like oh shit she is like I feel like sometimes parts of yourself go in a character and like you don't even realize it and I think a lot of times like when you read like an entire sort of like oeuvre or like an entire sort of yeah of like one writer like there's always themes that just are reoccurring right because like we write our obsessions and it's the same writer you know, it's the same writer writing all the books. Um, so Rachel is in some ways crafted in my image, but maybe, um, but maybe like a part, like an aspect, if that makes sense. Like not, like she's like a, um, she's like a, I don't know, she's like my kid kind of, you know, like we have, we have the same DNA, but like different we're also like very different and like, yeah. Um, as someone who has personally struggled with these thoughts and issues, what was writing Milk Fed like? Did writing about binging and stuff trigger you or are you so used to the thought that it didn't affect you? Some of the stuff was hard to read about, sorry. And as someone who experienced this more intensely than me, I can't imagine what writing it would have been like. Um, it felt, no, it felt very natural to write. I think, the thing about writing is that like, I'm in control of the narrative, you know, like in waking life, like I'm not in control of the narrative. Like I'm pretty powerless over like much of life. Right. And like, I think eating disorders themselves, it's like an attempt at control, you know, in a powerless universe or in a universe that I'm powerless over. Right. Like my history with eating disorders, like was all about control, right. Like taking a lot of like generalized, free floating anxiety, which I am have and external moving parts that I'm powerless over and channeling them all into one thing, one like mathematical system with which like Rachel, you know, I can control. The problem with that is then your whole life becomes reduced to a mathematical system. So it's like you're in control of this, but it's like this very tiny world, right? And I think that like mystery like if you're trying to be in control, like mystery is also what lends life its beauty, even though it's so scary, you know, and spirituality is all about mystery and sexuality is mystery, right? Like we're never going to pin this stuff down or at least I'm not. So, um, but for me writing about it, um, you know, I was in control of the narrative. Um, and so it wasn't, it just felt great it felt great to write about this stuff because um, it's different than living it. Cause when you're living it, you're like not in control, but I mean, that's probably also one of the reasons why I write, you know, to like control the narrative of like shit beyond my control. In your opinion, what dish slash food that you haven't tried yet seems to carry a high sexual a high sexual vibe. I guess it's sexual or sensual vibe. Lots of love from Mexico. A food that I haven't tried yet. Oh my God. I don't know. Can I do foods I have tried? Right now, like I, the first thing that comes to mind, this is like a food I love. Like, I don't know. I feel like pad thai is very sexy. I'm just going to say that. But if I think of something that I haven't tried, I'll, that I, that is set, like, I'm sure there are, I mean, there are lots of foods I haven't tried. I'll tweet it. Um, also like cream cheese, like fucking sexy as hell, but I've definitely tried that one. Okay. Was it important for you to make two female characters in this, or at least Rachel specifically bisexual rather than just gay queer? Well, I kind of feel like bisexual falls under the queer umbrella. Do you see much bi or like fluid female representation that represents you as a consumer of culture? Um, hmm. It's an interesting question. Um, I'd say like, 
I mean, to me, this was just always a story between two women, you know, like I didn't set out to say like, okay, I'm going to write like, I'm going to write like a tale of, you know, like, like it wasn't, it didn't start out as like two men or like um, a non-binary person and a man or like a man and a woman. Like it was always two women, you know, like this was always the story of two women. Um, and so shall it always be the story of two women. So in a way, like I didn't like in the same way that when I wrote the Pisces, like the character of Lucy and the, and the merman Theo were born at the same time, so too are these yin and yang characters of Miriam and Rachel. Um, and um, I, I haven't seen a ton, I'm trying to think about like bisexuality in literature. I mean, one of my favorite books um, that I read in the past couple years that like I felt like I really identified with and, and has a bisexual um, protagonist is Paul takes the form of a mortal girl. That fucking book, and shout out Andrea Lawler. Um, that was a book where I really saw so many elements um, of my own experience, particularly because like um, I related to like there, I just, I don't know that I related to like some of the time period in which it was set, like some of the time period in which it was set, like um, early 2000s, late 90s. Um, that was a time when I was very much like actively in pursuit of exploring my own sexuality rather than, and, and also spirituality. Like I was very much like the answer is outside me and I will figure it out, right? I'm gonna figure this out. Like, what am I, right? Like, what am I? Am I, am I, you know, what am I? And um, I want like a brand name sexuality. I want like a brand name God. You know, like I, I want to know, and like I would go to like psychics and astrologers, and I was like, somebody knows, like somebody knows, you know, like I was on the hunt. And I'm still a seeker, but um, I feel like I don't, you know, like maybe like a, a form of religion is like to live in the not knowing, you know, like I mean, yeah, I'm bi. Um, I'd probably say I was pan, but I also just feel like, I don't know, like, it's too late to change my driver's license or um, I always joke about that. I'm like, I'm like a lot older than Miley Cyrus. Am I allowed to call myself pan, but by pan, whatever. Like I'm, you know, that personally, but I don't really feel a need to like, um, you know, I'm just like me and like, um, that's kind of how it is now. And same with religion too, right? Truth is one paths are many. I think that's also how I feel about my sexuality. Um, okay. All right, question about sex without commitment. Okay, we have four minutes. I'm gonna answer two more really quickly. Um, question about sex without commitment. Melissa's books are super sexual and exciting, but is there happiness in these sexual encounters? Like it seems awesome, but thoughts on sex without commitment, please. Um, I think it depends on the encounter. Um, it depends on the encounter, what the, what the character, cause like there's good, you know, yay and nay. I mean, for me personally, in my own life, I feel like my best sexual experiences no offense to anyone I've been with, are like in my head. Um, you know, like it's, and I, I do tend to write a lot of fantasy. Like a lot of my, like the two sex scenes I just read were like, you know, in the, in the characters, in, in Rachel's head. They weren't even actually happening in real life. So, um, but, so I, I guess maybe, but I think actually, no, Miriam and Rachel in this book have like great, I mean, their sex is fucking hot. It's so hot, read it. You should read it and you can tell me if you think it's hot. Um, milk fed on sale today, um, a book. Okay, I'm gonna do one more. Um, and But sex on, my thoughts, per, well, we can, if you, you can email me if you wanna know about my, I think sex without commitment is amazing. I personally have found that I'm not like great at it. Like I tend to like get a little attached. I like don't want to, I like wish I was better at it, but we can talk more about that if you wanna talk, okay. Um, Melissa, you're a legend, thank you. I'm so excited for this book. I'm also really looking forward to the movie adaptation of the Pisces. Who would your dream cast be for Milk Fed? Um, okay, well, I like, we're starting to like look at casting and like I actually told the producers that like, I think Stacy is here, one of the producers for the, Stacy and Liz might be here too, they're, they're wonderful. Um, 
um, Stacy Silverman and Liz Tigelar. So I was like, listen, you guys like feel out the cat because I'm a producer for the show too. So I get to actually have like a, a little, like a say. And I was like, you feel out the casting. And if I feel like it's wrong, I'll tell you, but I'm kind of like a bad caster. Like, I feel like if I had my druthers, it would be like Chuck from Gossip Girl as Theo in um, the Pisces. Like nobody wants me casting. You know what I'm saying? Like my taste is just like wrong. So it's like, I don't know. And when I write my books, I don't tend to think of like, it's more of a feeling of a character, you know? Um, like I don't tend, um, yeah, so, okay. Um, I'll read, I'll do one more question. Okay, thanks so much for this reading. This was so fun. Between the passages you read in your early work in the Pisces, sex is always framed as this joyous and transgressive experience. But at the same time, it's also so messy and destabilizing that your protagonists often reach this moment where they're like, oh my God, is this appropriate? Okay. So I guess I'm curious to hear about your interest in writing these scenes. Is desire and sex something inherently complicated or something else going on? Um, for me, it's inherently complicated. Like, okay. Like in writing the Pisces, I was like, okay, like, yes, she's like on a rock, like having this, like, and there's a merman going down on her. And like, that's fucking like so hot. But like at the same time, like, um, of course she's gonna like worry that it's taking too long. Like even if I'm having, like, I don't know, I just, my female characters, like even if they're having their dream experience, they're still like, is like the merman getting tired down there? Or like, you're gonna get a urinary tract infection. You know what I'm saying? Like, just cause you're having, like if you don't pee after sex and like you have sex with a merman, like you're gonna get a UTI. It's just like, what is gonna happen in like, you know? So it's like magical realism only goes so far. Um, so it's called magical realism.